So good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ronan Nira. I'm a general partner at Carmel Ventures, one of the large VCs in Israel. That we focus a lot on on big data, and um, uh, you know, just um, after fierce negotiations with the organizers, they were you know able to allocate 25 minutes out of a 20-hour presentation to talk about the business aspects, uh, 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 you know, for this. And I think that we should, uh, you know, try to make a good a good use out of this. So there's a huge turnout over here, most of most of the technical people. But I think you know, in order to make uh, uh, data science and big data in general. Uh, and make Israel really a market leader and an industry leader, we have to build great companies that will be to be, um, uh, to be market leaders in this area. And uh, there are many, many challenges after the product is completed and launched in order to how to penetrate the market and how actually win uh, uh, customers. And I'm uh, you know, very uh, uh, happy and honored to host here in the panel uh, two representatives of two companies that I think are uh, you, you know, great uh, representatives of the industry that have managed to do the transition from a product to building a, you know, large and successful organization and become a market leader. Each one of those companies, respectively, is, is selling for, t for tens of millions of dollars. And I think that they have a lot to share with their experience. So, uh, on my right, uh, Ofer Bengal, uh, uh, co-founder and CEO of, uh, of Redis Labs. And just for full disclosure, I'm on the board of directors of Offer, so we've been working, um, uh, you know, for many, many years together. And uh, here on my right, uh, Eldad Farkash, uh, co-founder and CTO of Sysense, one of the most successful uh, data analytics company in the world today. Um, so we, uh, we heard about uh, what Redis Labs does from, from Iftah a while ago, so maybe I will start with you. Uh, I'll just, just uh, you know, brief uh, presentation of yourself and what Sysense does. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Eldad Farkash. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Sysense. Sysense solves uh, the BI food chain problem. We basically deal with complex data uh, that needs to be tapped to basic users. Unlike most of us here, we don't do infrastructure, we don't sell clusters, and we don't sell technology. So, we don't sell yet another database, whereas we embed the database behind a user focused mesh up environment that allows you to create dashboards and basically distinguish between doing things right and doing the right thing. Um, the company itself raised a hundred million dollars. The last round was by Bessemer Ventures. Previous investors participated on the round were Opus, Genesis, DFJ Growth and Battery. Um, we all have one goal in mind. We want to simplify data because data without users is just plain boring. And I'm here to tackle the other side of the ocean that is less scientific and more about frustration. <laughs> Thank you, Eldad. So maybe, Ophel, maybe we will start uh, with you with a question that, uh, uh, you know, for me is probably the biggest question in the essence of, uh, of data science uh, infrastructure, and that's the question of an open source between a commercial product. And when we look at the market today, we definitely you know, see a, a shift into new technologies. But most of those technologies, if we take the NoSQL area you know, with, with um, you know, MongoDB and, and Cassandra and other players, and also the analytics area with Hadoop and Spark, etc., it seems that the entire infrastructure is moving to open source. And that puts a huge challenge uh, behind, uh, you know, the ability to actually build companies, generate revenue, and have a sustainable business model. I think that, uh, you know, you in, Re in, in Redis Labs have managed to kind of, uh, you know, maybe find the magic between open source and a commercial product, and uh, would be happy if you can share, you know, your experience and your thoughts and the thing that we have gone through in, you know, or, you know finding this magic. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, hi, everyone. Um, you know, the open source traditionally has struggled with how to monetize, you know, what you do. Because on the other, on one hand, you would like to come up with the best product, open source product. And on the other hand, you need to make money at the end of the day. So, you know, the traditional approach was, hey, let's provide professional services around open source. Uh, and basically, this is selling heads. You know, you are providing commercial support, etc., etc. We thought that this is not a very good model because if you want to scale your business, you need to scale your headcount, and this is not desirable in our eyes. 
So the main, you know, the name of the game is how to create value on top of the open source. And as I said, there is a struggle between what you give as part of the open source and what you give beyond the open source. We decided, you know, we are a database company. And as a database company, um, we thought that it may be a good way to provide the onboarding, the implementation of the, the deployment of the database and the ongoing operation as added value on top of the core database. And this is how we started. We started with a new uh, business model which, which is called database as a service by which we deploy servers. Many of them, thousands of them are our servers which we rent on various public clouds. We put our technology on those servers and our customers put their data on those servers and we manage those databases for them. Quite, you know, uh, in, you, you would say that this is not very conservative in the eyes of traditional uh, enterprises, but it happened to work very, very nicely. So then we added the same thing for uh, on-prem uh, products that we have. And the idea was that, uh, you know, by have adding our technology, which makes the deployment of the database, and the ongoing operation much, much easier than if you have to do everything through the open source, that's good enough added value. So we think that, you know, there are ways you need to be innovative in order to, you know, to create that added values, but there are ways to do that, definitely. So just a follow-up question on this, because, uh, you know, we used to categorize the world into basically two types of go-to-market. One is, uh, a, you know, B2C applications, business to consumer, and the other was B2B, business to business applications. I think that what we are seeing in the big data infrastructure and in some other DevOps area is a new go-to-market, which we like to call B2D, and that's business to developers. So developers actually are a very, I think, a unique crowd in the way you market to them, and it creates both a challenge and opportunity. If you can just a little bit describe what you're doing over in Redis Lab in order to own the mind share of the developers. Yeah, well, developers are indeed uh, a very unique species. You know, you need to be very careful, very delicate with them. So yeah, I think that the first thing you have to do is really contribute to the community, con contri in, in terms of contributing code to the open source. And developers really value that. So that, that, this is, we, we do that a lot. So, you know, the creator of Redis is part of our company today. And also we have a group of people within the company that specifically deal with the open source apart from what we do for our commercial version. Uh, however, you, you need to do more than that to capture the, you know, the imagination and loyalty of developers. So first of all, you know, it's all about location and uh, uh, everything starts with the Silicon Valley, at least in our space. All the innovation and everything comes out of there. So you need to be there with people on the ground. So we have, you know, we opened our office with sales, marketing, and everything in the Silicon Valley and in, in Mountain View. And we have our developer advocacy operated from there. So we have people that uh, do meetups, webinars, etc., all across the US and also in Europe and other places. This is something that needs to be done. We participate in many events which are developer-centric such as, you know, Velocity Conference and many others like this. Uh, and we also do our own event, which is the annual Redis Conference. Uh, and this is, you know, talking about contributing. You know, first of all, you know, we, we always talk about contributing and my VP sales always says that we need to take back a little bit, you know. Uh, but um, wh what we are doing there is, you know, we, we spent around half a million dollars doing this event and we didn't get any direct benefit of it because the whole event was painted as, was shown as an open source community event rather than as a commercial event. So you need to be very, very careful, you know, with developers, the way you present what they do and if you do that right, and we always have within the company this control, you know, these arguments, 
how to present stuff that we are doing. You know, if you will say that our product is much better than the open source, well, these people may be offended. So you need to convey, you know, the message in other ways. Thank you. Eldad, I think that once, uh, you know, open source was the biggest questions behind uh, Redis Lab's ability to success. When I look at SciSense and I've been following uh, uh, from afar the company for several years, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, kind of a full stack analytics is a very crowded market. So just in the, in the last year, I'm not talking about uh, even, you know, the old, the old guys, the IBM, the SAP of the world, and, and, you know, the analytics and BI space has been around for the past 20 or 30 years. But in the last year alone, more than 50 companies in the world got funding of more than $25 million. So, so two questions. First of all, as a technical founder, when you founded the company, where was kind of, of the niche that you think that the market was missing and there is a place for an additional product behind this? And the second question, post-launch, how you think that in such a crowded market you are able to differentiate yourself and you know, grow so fast? So historically, when we launched SciSense, uh, we didn't have any clue whom we, whom we were going to sell to. We didn't have a user in mind. What we did have is a strong belief that the market goes in the wrong technological direction. We believe that this abuse of obstruction will lead to slow software and what we looked at databases, most specifically within the OLAP domain, which means getting simple users asking simple questions over complex data, we found out that there is a huge confusion. So and in many ways it boils down to the previous question is who pays for your software and who uses it. Um, and what we re realized is that the guy or girl who use the software never pay. Um, whether it's open source or commercialized uh, uh, proprietary stuff, um, there's always need to be a value along the food chain for someone who can uh, uh, write a check. Uh, uh, in our world, it should, would be the VP of marketing, the VP of operations, the group manager, guys who need mashups fast and are willing to pay a lot of money to bypass the big data team. So for them, the lake is yet another data source, uh, just like Vertical was before, just like SQL Server was before. Um, when we started, we were basically five years in a basement, uh, five founders working on that technology. It was an HPC technology with the intent of running database kernels on NUMA uh, 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 aware architectures as opposed to the typical scale out, uh, 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 you know, compressing, compression of nodes. Uh, when we came out at Strata in 2013, we basically showed how we replaced 70 nodes running Impala with one node running SciSense. And the uh, reason for that is SciSense was basically the only company back then that was five years ago that focused on cache conscious algorithms, where the whole industry focuses on cache oblivious algorithms. Um, the reason why SciSense succeeds today, and this is my third startup and it's by far the most successful one, is that unlike previous startups, we embedded the technology within something that is useful for users. So, and we were lucky. So four years ago, the mashups, the big data, they all uh, kind of shifted our focus on, uh, on focusing on users and, and focusing on the user experience. And if you look at SciSense today, half of the engineering team is very low level assembly and C level, whereas the other half is JavaScript user experience web. And they coexist and features are built together and I think the end result is a subscription-based software that is sold on a yearly basis, no matter whether you're in NASDAQ or GE or in eBay or a Wix now, or a two-person startup, they all pay in the same way, they all use the same software. In a funny way, a few years ago, we kind of, in, in the Israeli market, people got angry at us because they told us that we don't like customers because we don't visit them. We don't go you know, and drink the black coffee and talk for five hours why. Oracle cluster is or is not better than our database. And what we tell them is that we don't like customers, we're obsessed with customers, and even more, we're obsessed with users because our product should get things done uh, 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 very fast, which means 30 days of evaluation. So the whole culture of the company, the way we sell, yes, we have offices in New York, but they don't visit customers. They sell over the US. Yes, we have an EMEA sales team in, the, in Israel, but again, they don't visit customers. They all sell the same way through a lead gen pipeline, a very 
tight and, and you know, heavily analyzed machine, which leads to a thousand customers that was basically negative churn. So I, th I think that an interesting thing that, come, that comes up from, from both your, your answers is although kind of the original technology or the original IP that was developed is still the core of what you sell today, you keep constantly evolving the packaging in the business model, right? So you mentioned offer, uh, uh, you know, you started with an as a service model and then turned to an on-premise and today we even, uh, uh, you know, offer managed services. Uh, uh, you guys are moving from a perpetual licensing into more of a subscription uh, model. Can you tell a little bit maybe about, the, you know, the consideration how or, or, or the, uh, uh, the thought process within the within the company of how to take this, you know, core technology, but being able to implement it in different packaging in order to to uh, to answer market requests. So you know, I would like to tell a very structured and nice story, but unfortunately, I cannot because you know everything happened partly coincidence and partly because of uh, constraints. So when we started the company, we didn't have much money. We developed the technology and the, the idea was, okay, we have two ways of going to the market now. Doing uh, a fully managed service, which is zero touch, you don't need any salespeople for that, or to go for an on-prem product and, you know, having, you know, we are talking about a database here, so this needs to be done with salespeople, marketing, etc., etc. At that time, we, we didn't have any money whatsoever. So the natural choice was to go for a fully managed service, zero touch, no salespeople, and as a matter of fact, you know, until a year and a half ago, we did not have a single salesperson. Uh, and also, you know, everything was done through the website. Uh, all our infrastructure, which is, you know, today thousands of servers, were managed by a single person. So these are, you know, that's what happens when you are a startup company. Later on, we decided, okay, now that we are a database company, you know, we must offer, we must go to the large enterprises, and these guys would never put their stuff on someone else's servers, you know. So then we had to come up with an on-prem solution that can be deployed, you know, uh, in private data centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, one thing led to another. I can say that maybe the only thing which was really thought over very carefully was the recent uh, introduction of the Redis modules, which is an extension of Redis. And the idea behind that was, you know, Redis, a, a database is a very complex, you know, piece of, piece of code. And on one hand, you know, it's all about use cases. You know, you need to cover as many use cases as possible in order to make your database attractive, okay? Now, Oracle, IBM, Microsoft are doing this for, you know, 30 some years and they cover a lot. We and all the new breed of database companies, NoSQL companies, are doing that for the last five, seven, 10 years at the most. So, you know, and we are a small company and we cannot do everything. So the idea was to harness the community to contribute uh, use cases to our database. However, as I said, you know, a database is a very complex thing with many nuances, many, you know, small things that you need to do, very, very complex. So we thought, hey, how can we leverage the community to add to that? And the idea was, hey, let's build a very uh, clear API, and Redis is in memory, you know, everything runs in RAM, which makes it even more complex. So let's build an API that can enable developers add basically any piece of C code and run it as a core of our database. So that was really, you know, structurally thought, thought about and, you know, planned and, and designed. Eldad, can you maybe have a few comments whether the, kind of the new packaging, the, uh, the uh, new business model they're using, is that purely sales or marketing or does it have any product effects as well on how you 
you know, integrate all those together as a company? So with SciSense, I, I would say it's all about a product. I mean, we're, we're obsessed with embeddability, which basically means you take complex, large technologies and make them small enough for people to even not know about them. Um, we're passionate about uh, technology, which means that everything we do is, is, is to contradict the companies we hate so much. Uh, some of them were mentioned before. Um, and, and by the end of the day, SciSense is a business. And we believe that, uh, unlike developers, which I believe is a huge challenge, unlike developers, business users, business analysts, who need uh, uh, um, the data yesterday, who need those dashboards and mashups up and running, will pay for value quickly. And, and it's like, you know, it's like our history. It took us 40 years to figure out that we have a very short, very small shortcut uh, from Egypt to Israel. Once we got there, we went crazy. And, and the same goes with Sizens. It took us a lot of time uh, 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 to focus on technology, which might be wrong, by the way. If you, if you look at it, uh, uh, you know, startups today, they are not from Israel and have this access to the market. They tend to go up much quicker, but they also get to go dry uh, at, the same at the same pace. And with Israeli startups, you see this long uh, 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 ride across the desert. Uh, uh, those who pass it uh, usually figure out that they have something valuable for users and they figure out how to sell it. So, so you know, the, the, the audience that we have here, are, you know, most of the people are very, very uh, you know, technical. Some of them are working in large corporations, some of them in, in startups. For, for both of you and, and your co-founders, it is not your first startup. And um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, thinking more of a, even a personal question. When you started this company, uh, what did you bring from, you know, the other from the other company in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the experience, the emotional roller coaster, maybe the right balance between technology and market, and how did this play out uh, today, Ophel? So, you know, I, I must admit that not much because the environment has changed so much. You know, I started my my first company in 1990. Completely different environment, you know, I'm not talking about technology, I'm talking about the way you do business, etc., etc. So much has, you know, so many things have changed through that, that I, you know, I had to really reinvent everything I did as a co-founder and as a CEO of a company uh, with, with this company. Especially, the, uh, you know, the open source thing, which was almost non-existent at that time and how to deal with the open source, etc., etc. So, obviously, you bring, uh, you know, managerial capabilities that you gained over the years, etc. But in terms of how to do the business today, completely different. Dad? So everything is the same, you know, the same, more of the same. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, every, you know, I, my first startup, just to give you an example, uh, we kind of, the, the a day after we named the startup, I got sued. My mom threw me out of bed. Uh, I was at high school uh, uh, and, and she screaming at me. The facts, facts, you know, really. for those who know what it is, in my face telling me I got sued because I used the name of an existing international company called PureSoft uh, back then. So this is how I started my uh, uh, startup experience by being completely uh, uh, unaware of everything that's out there. Um, of course, things changed since then, but think that what makes Israeli startups so different, so unique, and so powerful, even when we stand across those much heavier invested uh, 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 Silicon Valley companies, is culture, is our obsession with those things we do, and, and the fact that founders and even employees, and, and the distinction is so small with most companies I've seen in Israel, um, is that they're betting everything on, on, on becoming successful, and not just iterating through trying to succeed process, whereas their whole, everything is, is their startup and, and they kind of put everything into it, okay. so. Thank you, Guy, I would like to thank you. I think that what we are seeing, you know, we're seeing over here and, and uh, you know, for both of these examples, this is a long journey. Those companies have been around, have started um, seven or eight years ago and they had their ups and downs and there's a lot of technology development and infrastructure product, uh, you know, products that goes and only three or four years after that we start the actual traction with the market and that's where the real game starts. So at least for me, both companies are an inspiration I think should be for all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you, Thanks.